NASA's Executive Director. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation. I impact student achievement, strategies to influence educational leaders to support school health. The American School Health Association, or ASHA, is the only organization that addresses multiple disciplines in school health and that is devoted solely to school health. Our membership of approximately 800 individuals represents school health as administrators, counselors, dietitians, nutritionists, health educators, physical educators, psychologists, school health coordinators, school nurses, school physicians, and social workers. The proud publishers of the Journal of School Health, a premier journal in the area of school and adolescent health. Members of ASHA can elect to receive a hard copy or electronic copy of the journal. Our membership fee is inexpensive and provides you access to the journal and also to our bi-weekly e-newsletter, School Health Action, as well as free continuing education hours through webinars such as today's presentation and through CE qualifying Josh articles. If you haven't already, please consider joining, volunteering, and becoming a member of the ASHA community. Visit us at ashaweb.org to learn more. As I mentioned, the continuing education credit for today's webinar is free for all members. If you are a non-member and you would like to receive CE credit for this webinar, we require a payment of $30. After the webinar, you can receive one category, one CECH, M. Chez and Chez, one CNE hour for nurses, one CPEU for RD and DTRs, or a certificate of attendance based on 70% or more participation today. Participation is measured by the amount of time the webinar remains active on your screen. We'll provide details for obtaining CE in a post-webinar email that will go out later this week. Before we get started on today's session, please save the date on November 18th for a webinar on food allergy safety in schools. We will share evidence-based and best practice guidance and strategies consistent with the CDC guidelines for making schools safe for students with life-threatening allergies. Learn more and register at ashaweb.org. Just a couple of notes before we begin. Your, mo your phones will remain muted for the 60-minute duration of this webinar. If you have a question for our presenters, please type them into the questions box on your screen. We will answer your questions today as time allows. All unanswered questions will be responded to and provided in the post-webinar email that you will receive at the, by the end of this week. We'll also include the evaluation survey, instructions for submitting for CE, the recording of the presentation, as well as the slide deck for today's presentation. Now, let's get started with today's session. We are delighted to have Sharon Murray and Natalie Boyer from RMC Health presenting I Impact Student Achievement, Strategies to Influence Educational Leaders to Support School Health. RMC Health is a professional development organization with a deep expertise in healthy schools to work with the healthy school community to build their capacity through planning, professional development, and ongoing support to be more effective in their day-to-day -day and long-term strategic activities. RMC Health is a 40-year-old organization that has trained more than 35,000 healthy school community members in all 50 states to positively affect the health and well-being of hundreds of thousands of children and youth. Now, a little more about today's presenters. Sharon Murray has been president since 2008 and oversees the strategic and day-to-day -day operations of RMC Health. She has more than 20 years' experience in professional development as well as the school, public, and health education field. Prior to RMC Health, Sharon coordinated the school health efforts for the Florida Department of Education, providing training, technical assistance, and evaluation services. She also testified before the United States House of Representatives on the need to expand funding for school health programs. Sharon is also on the board of ASHA. Natalie Boyer has been with RMC Health since 2009 and leads the Second Chance Tobacco Education Program and the Healthy Eating Active Living Program with Denver Public Schools. She has more than 20 years' experience in professional development in the school and public health environment. 
prior to RMC Health, Natalie worked at the District Health Coordinator for Summit School District in Colorado, implementing the coordinated school health model and supervising the health services staff. In addition to the wide array of trainings, Natalie has also served as a board member with the state school-based health center organization and a local community health care nonprofit. Welcome, Sharon and Natalie. I'm now going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lee. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is Sharon Murray, and I will be our primary presenter today. With me, of course, is Natalie Boyer, who will help me primarily with the interactive activities that we're going to do throughout the presentation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. A few notes before we get started. During today's presentation, I will highlight and point you towards some of the latest research and resources available linking health and student achievement. And as Lee mentioned, please note that you will receive research citations and additional support materials in follow-up email communication. Our objectives for the presentation today are to explore the link between health and student achievement, to reframe how we present that data and research to education leaders, and then to begin craft, crafting messages to advocate for healthy schools uh, with education leaders. As Lee mentioned, a little bit about RMC Health, we are a nonprofit professional development organization with deep expertise and experience with all facets of healthy schools. We work with the healthy schools community across the country to build capacity through planning, professional development, and ongoing support so that our clients are more effective in day-to-day -day and long-term strategic activities that have a positive impact on their work with children and adolescents. We're located in Lakewood, Colorado, just outside of Denver, and we'd love to know where all of you are from. So soon on the screen, you will see a poll with the regions listed where you might reside. So what I'd like you to do is respond to the poll with where you are so we can get a sense of who is with us today. Thanks, Sharon. It looks like we're getting lots of responses in, um, and it looks like most people have responded, so I'm going to close the, close the poll and share it. So it looks like we have 22% from the Northeast, 22% from the Southwest, a great showing from the Midwest with 34%, 12% in the Southwest, and 10% from the Northwest. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, everyone, for participating. What a wonderful representation. And again, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. We know this to be true. Healthy students are better learners. Not only do we know this through the research, but also anecdotally. Why else would our school principal send home notes before test day encouraging parents to make sure students get a good night's sleep and a hearty breakfast before test? Because we intrinsically understand that health and education are integrally linked. Dr. Joycelyn Elders, former U.S. Surgeon General, has said you cannot educate a child who is not healthy and you cannot keep a child healthy who is not educated. Just like adults at work, it's difficult for students to be successful in school if they're hungry, sick, in pain, scared, or depressed. A middle school principal I once work, worked with in Florida said to me, health just invades your office. You either deal with it now, thoughtfully and purposefully, or you will deal with it later. Schools are a perfect place to create a health-promoting culture to support student growth and development. If students report a strong sense of engagement with and connectedness to school and or adults at school, they are more likely to do well both academically and socially. We know healthy students are successful students. So first, let's define what we, what we mean by academic achievement. In this resource that you see on the, on the screen now, this is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where they have defined academic achievement into three categories, academic performance, education behavior, and students' cognitive skills and attitudes. 
And as shown here, academic performance includes grades, standardized test scores, and graduation rates. Education behavior includes attendance, dropout rates, behavioral problems in the classroom and at school. And then students' cognitive skills and attitudes include concentration, memory, and mood. And so let's explore this link a little further. Over the last decade, more and more research has come out linking health and student achievement. I will highlight just some of it for you today. Also, as we'll explore later in the presentation, gathering local data will be especially powerful for you to make the case for health with education leaders. Many leading causes of death, including chronic diseases and injuries, are related to behaviors that are adopted during youth and carried forward into adulthood. Data here show educational attainment and health status during adulthood are indeed connected. Education is one of the strongest predictors of health. The more schooling people have, the better their health is likely to be. Conversely, the less schooling people have, the higher their levels of risky health behaviors, such as smoking, being overweight, or having a low level of physical activity. Results from the 2009 Youth Risk Behavior Survey show students with better grades were significantly less likely to have engaged in behaviors such as carrying a weapon to school, cigarette and alcohol use, sexual activity, being sedentary, and watching TV for more than three hours per day. And a recent analysis from 2012 also concludes that adolescents who engage in higher rates of risk behaviors associated with leading causes of death, disability, and social problems are significantly less likely to do well academically. In October of 2011, ASHA published a special issue of the Journal of School Health highlighting landmark research by Dr. Charles Bash, Richard March Ho Professor of Health and Education at Teachers College. This graphic summarizes those findings. In his research, Dr. Bash identified seven health problems that disproportionately affect urban minority youth. These health problems, seen along the left side of, of the slide, vision and hearing, asthma, teen pregnancy, aggression and violence, physical activity, breakfast, and ADHD, influence students' motivation and ability to learn. He then identified causal pathways that are influenced by these health problems and therefore have an impact on educational outcomes. The causal pathways are along the right side of the slide, sensory perception, cognition, dropping out, school connectedness, and absenteeism. So for example, if you look at asthma, asthma, particularly poorly controlled asthma, has an impact on cognition, school connectedness, and absenteeism. Asthma is the most common chronic disease affecting youth in our country, and it's the leading cause of absenteeism. Children with asthma have been shown to perform worse on some tests of concentration and memory. They're more likely to experience sleep problems, which also affects cognition, and to experience feelings of anxiety and shyness, thus affecting their school connectedness. These problems, these health, all, of, all seven health problems are interconnected and synergistic. The more health problems experienced, the more negative educational outcomes. Prior to the 2011 special manuscript, Dr. Bash also wrote this 2000, 2010 report where he states that no matter how well teachers are prepared to teach, no matter what accountability measures are put in place, no matter what governing structures are established for schools, educational progress will be profoundly limited if students are not motivated and able to learn. Healthy eating is an area with strong evidence linking healthy eating behaviors and student achievement. Here is another great resource from CDC. And evidence has shown that specific dietary practices and issues are related to different aspects of student academic achievement. In particular, student participation, 
in the USDA school breakfast program is associated with increased academic grades and test scores, reduced absenteeism, and improved memory. Skipping breakfast leads to a decrease in alertness, attention, memory, processing of complex visual displays, and problem solving. Not eating enough of specific foods, such as fruit, vegetables, and dairy can also lead to lower grades. Not getting enough of certain nutrients, such as vitamins A, B6, B12, C, folate, iron, zinc, and calcium can lead to lower grades and higher rates of absenteeism and tardiness. And finally, hunger or food insufficiency leads to lower grades, higher rates of absenteeism, repeating a grade, and an inability to focus in the classroom. Also from CDC, this chart details strong evidence between physical activity and achievement. Specifically, phys physically active students tend to have better grades, school attendance, memory, and on-task behavior in the classroom. Higher levels of physical activity and physical fitness are associated with improved concentration and memory. More participation in physical education class has been associated with better grades, standardized test scores, and on-task behavior. Time spent in recess has been shown to positively affect students' attention, concentration, and classroom behaviors. It reduces misbehavior. This alone should be a reason for not taking recess away as punishment. It's the very thing those students need to get back on track. Brief classroom physical activity breaks, for example, five to 10 minutes, are associated with improved attention and concentration, the ability to stay on task during class, and educational outcomes that include standardized test scores, reading literacy, and math fluency scores. And finally, participation in extracurricular physical activities such as interscholastic sports has been associated with higher GPA, lower dropout rates, and fewer disciplinary problems. The preceding slides showcased national data, which I hope you found compelling. However, to truly make an impact on lo local decision makers, having local data to tell your story is critical. So here's an example from Lincoln Public Schools in Nebraska. This information was shared with me by Julaine Hill, who's the Coordinated School Health Director at the Nebraska Department of Education. As you can see from the graphic, physically fit students were far more likely to meet and exceed state math test scores than their unfit peers. And this is in fourth to eighth grade. And the same pattern actually holds true for their state reading scores. You've heard the expression, all politics is local. The same holds true for data. Having local data will help create the imperative for leaders and stakeholders to take action. It will help you rally your cause and clarify your priority goals. In these two brief slides, Lincoln Public Schools effectively created an imperative by saying our math and reading test scores should increase if we increase the number of students who are physically fit. So now, this becomes a strategy for them to support academic achievement. So it's important to always think about how your priority health concerns can be a strategy to support student academic achievement in your school and your district. Additionally, we know there is a reciprocal relationship to health, education, and poverty. Here's another example of powerful local data that compels people to action. This slide is from Oakland Unified School District, and this was shared with me by Curtis Saraki, Deputy Chief of Community Schools and Student Services with Oakland Unified School District. And this data powerfully shows the, the stark differences in life and school experiences depending on which neighborhood students reside in all within Oakland Unified School District. So compared to an affluent white neighborhood, Af or students in an affluent white neighborhood, African American students living in West Oakland face far more health challenges, and those end up having uh, consequences on their educational outcomes. 
And as you can see, the difference of a couple of miles within this one school district can mean years of difference in life expectancy. Also from Oakland Unified School District, this data shows connections between health and social issues to educational outcomes. Students living in poverty are achieving at far lower percentages in English language arts in third grade. And one more slide from Oakland Unified School District shows the relationship between students with asthma and their rates of chronic absenteeism. As you can see in all subgroups, students with asthma are far more likely to be chronically absent, which we know is an indicator of student achievement. I think the connection is clear. And even with compelling data at our fingertips, we still struggle to make the case with education leaders to fully support healthy schools work. Education leaders know health and education are interrelated. Most education leaders truly care about the health and well-being of their students. However, schools are already asked to do so much. The reality is that schools do not have the resources, financial, material, personnel, knowledge, to fully and adequately address the many health challenges that, that face our students today. Some administrators also view health, health issues to be outside their scope of work, and others are concerned about diverting scarce time and resources away from academic learning. In order to make our case, we must speak the language of administrators, crafting messages that are tailored to address those issues of highest importance and priority. We must also seek to understand their concerns, challenges, and the environment in which they must operate. Before we move on, let me take a moment to find out the types of education leaders you are hoping to impact. On the screen, you'll see another poll. Click as many responses as are appropriate. Like we're getting a good response coming in. I'm going to give it a few more seconds so that people have time to make their selection. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. And it looks like 81% are hoping to influence school principals, 60% school district superintendents, 56% other top-level school district administrators, and 51% school board members. Excellent. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you for your responses. And I understand wanting to impact that school principal. They are indeed on the ground impacting our young people on a daily basis. And so now let's actually hear the perspective of one school principal. There we go. At the recent ASHA conference just a couple of weeks ago, Mark Pinder, principal of Milwaukee High School located in a suburb of Portland, discussed the many issues that he and his administration must focus on. As you can see, student achievement is number one, followed by state test scores and graduation rates. And as we know, all of these are impacted by health issues. Even if you look down to the sixth bullet, the helping parents parent is related to the, the kind of work that we do, engaging families and communities in meaningful ways to support student health initiatives is critically important so that healthy behaviors can be practiced and reinforced in all the places students live, play, and learn. Principal Pinder went on to outline his top three school priorities. I bet you're at the edge of your seat wondering, oh my gosh, what are the top three priorities? And here's what he gave us. Clearly, schools have many, many things going on, and administrators and school staff are pulled in many different directions. And being able to narrow it down to your top three school priorities is practically impossible because everything seems so critically important. 
furthermore, educational leaders' area, areas of expertise is not usually in a health-related profession. And so it takes time for us to educate them on how addressing health issues will have an impact on the broader academic environment of the school and the district. It takes time, energy, and attention to build our case and to build our base of allies and champions. So this is one school principal's perspective on priorities. And while I do feel it's representative of what many administrators face across the country, take a moment to consider the unique priorities that are facing your school and your district. For this next section of the presentation, let's just revisit for a moment the three categories that define academic achievement because we'll come back to them. I'm going to ask you to consider them here in just a moment. So academic performance, education behavior, and students' cognitive skills and attitudes. To best engage education leaders, we must communicate in language that speaks to student achievement. A few years ago, I was preparing a presentation to my daughter's principal on coordinated school health. As I went through all of my notes on the different components and their impact on student achievement, I realized my principal's eyes were glazing over. It's not that she was inattentive or even uninterested, but I was talking health speak, not education speak. And that's when I realized I needed to flip my script. Start with the achievement indicators first. I needed to make my message relevant to what she is held accountable for. I know this is a lot for you to look at, but on the left, this is, this is what my message maybe used to look like if I want to impact uh, school breakfast, for example. So I might start with childhood obesity is a serious problem in our community. Students need access to healthy food options during the school day in order to learn how to eat healthy for a lifetime. Breakfast is a particularly important meal since research shows that people who skip breakfast have lower metabolism that can lead to weight gain. We have the opportunity to help our students learn to choose healthy food options now. We know that healthy students learn better. This one is all about health, right? So I, so I thought, let's flip the script. So let's say you're working with a school that has a problem with absenteeism. You start by saying, I understand school attendance is a priority for our school. Did you know that students who eat breakfast at school have lower rates of tardiness and absenteeism? I know that our breakfast participation rates are currently less than 50% of eligible students. By doing targeted outreach to boost breakfast participation, we could make a positive impact on attendance. So in both cases, I'm advocating for in increased participation in the school breakfast program. But I wonder which message education leaders would listen to most. I can almost guarantee you that they will be far more receptive to the one that leads with attendance and links the strategy of school breakfast to student academic achievement. So it's important for us to reframe our thinking in this manner. So let's do some practice. On your screen, you'll see another poll. I'm wondering what priority health issues do you want to work with schools on? You may select as many as apply. Thanks, Sharon. We're starting to get some responses in. It looks like most people have indicated their responses. It looks like the priority health issues that our participants want to work on with schools are 79% healthy eating, 77% physical education and activity, 44% sexual and reproductive health, 53% social and emotional health, and 51% chronic disease management, such as asthma and diabetes. Great. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, everyone, for your responses. Certainly, I know you may be working on other health issues than what were listed here. This was just to get a, a sense of your broad perspectives and priorities. 
Okay, so now consider now consider what does your priority health issue impact? So remember the different categories of academic achievement being academic performance, education behavior, or students' cognitive skills and attitudes. And as you're thinking about your priority issue, which many of you, uh, your priority issue sounds like healthy eating and physical physical education and physical activity, think about a couple of, I have a couple of examples to illustrate further how you can reframe your thinking. Obesity has a strong impact on education behavior and students' cognitive skills and attitudes. Obese children miss an average of nine more school days or more days per school year than their healthy weight counterparts. Recent research suggests that childhood obesity may also affect cognition and therefore academic achievement. Furthermore, children in grades three through six who are obese are 65% more likely to be bullied than their healthy weight peers feeling disconnected. Obese children often suffer from depression, anxiety, and isolation from their peers. Students who do not feel connected to school and peers have lower grades and higher dropout rates. So that's one example of how you frame your health issue in the language of academic achievement. And the next example is, teen pregnancy clearly impacts students' academic performance and education behavior. We know that just 38% of teen girls who have a child before age 18 gets a high school diploma, and less than 2% of teen moms earn a college degree by age 30. Teen moms who leave their parents' home are far more likely to live below the poverty line, and children born to mothers younger than 18 years old score significantly worse on measures of school readiness, including math and reading tests. On your screen, you will see our final poll, and I want you to consider the priority health issue that you are concerned about. What areas of academic achievement do they impact? and select all that apply. Thank you, Sharon. We're starting to get some responses in. I'll give it a few more seconds so people have time to indicate their response. Okay. It looks like academic performance, 85%, education behavior, 80%, and students' cognitive skills and attitudes, 65%. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, everyone, for your responses. That's excellent. Now you are ready to start crafting your message for education leaders. In the email that you received prior to this webinar, you hopefully received the uh, form that you see on the screen. This attachment was included. This worksheet takes you step by step through the process to create messages that will resonate with education leaders and other relevant stakeholders. First, you'll describe what you do, not your job description, but the work that you do. Then you will list why this is so important and then finally, you'll articulate the impact of what you do. And here's where you will incorporate data that show the link between what you do and student achievement. And so while today's presentation is focused on speaking the language of education leaders, moving forward, you will also want to consider how you might change your message to suit different audiences, such as parents, students, colleagues, community members, stakeholders, groups, media, and others. Also consider what data do you have and what data do you need. Clearly, we highlighted some national data today. There's much more out there. And what local data do you need to help make your case? And who do you need to partner with, for example, um, to get data that maybe you don't have yet? And then finally, who are your allies and your adversaries, and how will you work with both in order to get your message out about the importance of your priority health concern and how 
addressing it is a strategy to improve student academic achievement and success. We have a few examples. You really do impact student achievement. So here's a sample pitch that was developed using the worksheet on the slide before. Physical activity during the day is essential. Getting students up and moving throughout the school day is simple and only takes five to 10 minutes. Students benefit by increased concentration and attention to tasks. Short bursts of physical activity give students time to re-energize and then re-engage in learning. Access to physical activity during the day can lead to higher literacy and math scores. So that's one pitch that was developed using the form, and here's another. School-based health centers support student achievement by identifying and treating oral, physical, and mental health conditions. The clinic is located in the school and minimizes time out of class. Students who are healthy are more ready to learn. So you can see in both of these pitches, the, the author took the what is important, the why it's important, and then the impact of the work that they do. And your pitch can be longer, it can be shorter, but tailored to certainly focus on how what you do impacts student achievement. Because I know the work of everyone in healthy schools has a positive impact on the health and academic success of our nation's young people. So as you are preparing to talk with education leaders, remember to gather data. Hard facts, of course, are always great, but anecdotal stories work too. Feel free to gather success stories, get, get the word from students who are affected, teachers who see the impact in the classroom on behavior and on uh, test scores, for example, so get their stories. Talk with others who can then tell your story, so share your message, share the impact that you are having and your colleagues are having so that others can, can speak on behalf of your great work. Work with ex existing groups, such as your district or school health advisory council. And I always like to say when it comes to advocacy, it's important to make friends before you need them. You want to position yourself as the go-to person for your health issue. Don't always ask for something. Simply offer to be a resource or a reference so that when resources do become available, you're top of mind for that, education, uh, for that educational leader. You're the one that they want to go to in particular. As I mentioned at the beginning of the pre presentation, I will share a research and resource list in follow-up email communication. However, I did want to highlight these two excellent resources for you. The first one is Health and Academic Achievement, published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Division of Population Health. And the second one is How Schools Work and How to Work with Schools, published by the National Association of State Boards of Education. Both of them were released within the last few months and they provide excellent data and rationale on the link between student health and academic achievement. And I certainly looked to both of these resources to help prepare for today's presentation. Links, of course, to download these will be included in follow-up communication. So in summary, I have been working in the school health field for close to 20 years now. And whereas I've seen many education leaders champion the link between health and student achievement, I believe there's a bigger shift coming. I've seen more awareness and openness to new strategies to address health challenges in students. More education leaders are recognizing and supporting efforts in their districts and schools to address health problems that affect students' ability to achieve. You can see here, Dr. Sarah Jerome, past president of the American Association of School Administrators, has said, our efforts to improve the physical and mental health of our students are inextricably tied to our efforts to improve student achievement. We still have a long way to go, and I'm grateful for the leadership of organizations such as ASHA, CDC, ASCD, the American Association of School Administrators, and the National Association of State Boards of Education, and many others, too, too many to name, 
but for providing education and advocacy to support healthy school environments across the nation. However, it is your work on the ground that will truly make a difference. By sharing your successes, your challenges, your data, and most importantly, your passion for the health of our nation's young people, you will help us create a healthy educational environment for each and every student that will enable them to learn, grow, and thrive. My thanks to you for your participation. I hope you'll find the information and resources useful and meaningful in your work. And I'm going to turn it over to Abby so that we can have questions. Great. Thank you. And actually, this is Lee. Um, Thank you so much, Sharon, for your talk and for um, providing all this great information for our audience today. I mentioned at the top of the presentation that we would be accepting questions throughout, and I see that many of you have been very actively submitting questions. I encourage you at this time to continue to submit your questions um, because we do have some time to respond to them. Um, we've also been busily responding to folks so um, at this time, I don't have um, any questions that have not been responded to, but I would like to take this time to kind of share with the audience some of the common questions that we've had, just in case um, there are some of you out there who didn't ask but are wondering. Um, and so, so I'll just kind of run through them, and then um, maybe we'll get some more questions while I'm doing that. So um, starting out, uh, we've had uh, one question from a few people asking about uh, whether or not the presentation will be available, and yes, we will. Um, as I mentioned, we are planning to send out post-webinar email over the next couple of days. Uh, in the next, you know, sometime this week, you'll receive it. It will include a link to the slide deck, so you will have the PowerPoint. It actually will also include a recording of the of the webinar. Um, we'll also provide in that the survey. We hope you can complete the survey. And if you're interested in earning continuing education, um, you'll need to complete that survey, and, and we'll help you get to the link to, to apply for that. Um, also, uh, we had a question that came in asking about the term academic achievement that Sharon used. That's something, a, a term that CDC uses, and wondering if um, that is the same definition um, that the Department of Education and other national education organizations use. And uh, the response to that is that it's not necessarily the exact same wording. Some others use the term academic indicators. Also, we had a number of different questions that came up when, we, when Sharon was talking about the Omaha slide um, with the chart about being fit. And a few of you asked, what, you know, how did they measure being fit? Um, that is something that we can't provide to you right now live, but our presenters are going to go back and pull that for you, and that response will be included in our post-webinar email, so look for that. Um, also, someone, I, I actually thought of it myself, um, but somebody wanted us to share that there is um, a great tool by the NACDD, the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, that was prepared. Um, it really speaks to what Sharon was discussing in, in terms of really trying to um, speak the language of, of the educators. And, the, and the, the resource is actually called Speaking Education's Language, a Guide for Public Health Professionals Working in the Education Sector. Um, that's something that um, we will also include in our follow-up email. You can also find it on ASHA's resources page. A number of the different resources that Sharon presented to you today are, are found on the ASHA resources pages at ashaweb.org. So feel free to go there as well. Um, OK, so that's, that's my summary of the questions that we received during the webinar. And I think we got a couple more. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll throw those out to you. Um, so Sharon, here's the first one. What is a good strategy for a district administrator to use I will encourage a healthier environment in a Title I school. Thanks, Lee, and thank you for the question. I think certainly, you know, the um, the link, the reciprocal relationship between health, education, and poverty 
is striking. And so I would, I would look for that kind of data, uh, in particular if there is a way that the school district administrator could perhaps partner with the school, excuse me, the local health department to see is there neighborhood level data or uh, within a district regional type data that could show are there pockets of health problems that align with um, neighborhood schools, for example, and then uh, and then address those challenges through that through that data. Um, so that's probably where I would start. I would look to local health department and community partners for some of the data to identify where the pockets of, of health problems are, and then and then go from there. Okay, great. All right. Um, we did actually hear from someone who is on the webinar from, Web uh, from Omaha, and they let us know that the data uh, from the Lincoln Public Schools uh, was, it, it used the PACER test for FIT, if, if folks are familiar with that. Um, I haven't gotten any more questions in this time. Um, do feel free to go ahead and, and send them in. Um, and I guess, do you have any um, other final comments or thoughts, Sharon, Natalie, that you want to share? We're thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I hesitate to, um, to end early because people may have questions. We've had a lot of really great questions come in throughout, and I want to give people an opportunity. Um, I will also share that... Um, as I mentioned, this post-webinar email will come out in the next couple of days. Um, one of the things that will also be included is the answers to all of the questions. So if you think of one after we close out today, feel free to go ahead and send it to, to us at ASHA. You can send that to info at ashaweb.org. And we'll be glad to send that on to Sharon and her team to include in their responses um, that we'll send out to all the attendees. Oh, here's another question. Okay, so this one's for you, Sharon. Regarding sexual health and reproduction health, can you point to a best practice being used currently in a district? I'm sure that I can. I need to do a little research on that first. And I would actually reach out to some colleagues in state departments of education to seek some of their guidance. I'd look towards the um, national campaign to prevent teen pregnancy. Uh, I'd look to leaders such as such as those to confirm that. Also, uh, a, a wonderful resource that is soon to be available is from the American Academy of Pediatrics um, School Health Services Assessment Tool, which has a, a wonderful comprehensive piece on sexual health services, the policies, practices, practices and protocols surrounding that so that uh, districts can identify where the where they're doing well and where the gaps are. So there's definitely resources and I'll do some more looking and follow up in the written communication FAQs. All right. Um, don't think we have any oh here's another one. Um, here's uh, Question, Colorado has, well, I think it's more of just a statement. Colorado has great comprehensive sexual health education standards, and some districts are integrating this into science if there isn't a required health class. Is that something you're familiar with, Sharon? Yes. At the middle and high school level. Yes, I think, yes, there's some wonderful work going on at the local level. I will say that um, just, like, just like many other states, it's district by district. One of the things that you mentioned early on in your presentation, Sharon, was um, talking about how recess is so important and it improves classroom behaviors to actually be in recess. and. That, um, that punishing children and keeping them out of recess for bad behavior actually makes the problem worse. 
Um, is that something, is, is there some, some kind of message that people can give to their supervisors at school to, to change that? Well, I, I think the, I think just that, that taking recess away from misbehaving students is counterproductive and can actually exacerbate the misbehavior. And so I think that we need to, we need to again, rethink that, that particular practice and allow students who are maybe having challenges to participate in recess. And I think, I think we'll see the difference almost immediately. Are there, um, are there any schools that have done that, that you can point to that, um, that people can, can share with their, their schools? I know a lot of schools that, that have done that. I can't name them off the top of my head, but can find some, a, a few that, that we can get a contact person for folks who'd be interested. Okay, here's another question. In terms of providing local data to schools, what specific pieces of data tend to get schools' attention most effectively? Can you repeat that for me, Lee? The, in terms Certainly. Of, yeah. In terms of providing local data to schools, what specific pieces of data tend to get schools' attention most effectively? Well, that's a great question. And in the administrators, the, I've, I've spoken with a number of superintendents and school principals. And what really gets their attention is anything that impacts attendance, because that, in, in addition to academic achievement, we know, you know students who are in class are better able to learn. But that's also a budget issue for the school district in terms of counts. Um, so attendance is always something that, that gets administrators' attention, but also test scores. Um, they, they're being held accountable for test scores more and more, and, and even with new teacher effectiveness requirements, there's, there's intense pressure for students to perform well on the statewide testing. And so any kind of data that shows how the health challenges of a district could potentially, if addressed, impact student achievement related to the test scores and attendance, I think, certainly get administrators' attention. That being said, there are unique challenges within you know, different school districts and schools that, that folks would know best what, what would get their attention. But universally, I think attendance and test scores tend to perk up the ears of education leaders. Lee, are you still with us? Hi, this is Lee. Are you, can you hear me now, Sharon? Yes. OK, I apologize. My phone dropped out. Um, OK, so um, looking, I, I don't believe we have any further questions. Um, so I think we're done today. And um, again, I know I've mentioned it a, a lot, but um, do look for a follow-up email coming in the next couple of days. We're going to have quite a few resources for you. And again, if you have questions that you think of that you just weren't able to submit in time, please do send them to info at ashoweb.org, and we'll be happy to pass those on. And um, thank you once again, Sharon and Natalie, for your presentation. And um, we appreciate it, and I think we're, we're done. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, the webinar has now ended. Thanks.